Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Paul. I'm an alcoholic, and it's a privilege and an honor to be asked to come here and uh, kick off the weekend. And uh, in fact, I used to say a privilege and an honor, and it was pointed out to me that it, it's really a, a commitment and a responsibility. I was called up by the committee and offered to take this commitment, and because I'm sober today, because of Alcoholics Anonymous, I was responsible enough and accountable enough to make my way here today and to spend the evening with you. It's my first time in Akron. I'm really looking forward to taking in all the uh, the sites that, on all the tours and so forth, and um like was just said there, my, my home group is the, the West End High Noon Group in Long Beach, New York. And to give you an idea what sort of alcoholics we are, it's not just noon. It's high noon. You know. <laughs> Gary Cooper, Grace Kelly. We have two meetings a week. One's at 7.15 on a Thursday night. The other one's at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning, you know. Who <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. There's some idea where we're coming from in sobriety. We, we've sort of occupied the lower, the lower end of the AA gene pool, you know, and we're very happy there, you know, and, uh, and to be here tonight, like, just, like, when, when Bob called me up, I was like, I seen the, the lineup of speakers, and I was just overwhelmed that I was asked to play a small part in this, and it's just unbelievable, and, but my wife, my wife's a non-alcoholic, and this stuff doesn't really faze her, you know. I, I was shown her the program, and uh, I like look at the different names and whatnot. And look, there's my name, you know. And uh, <laughs> according to her, being a good speaker in Alcoholics Anonymous is like being the tallest of the seven dwarfs, you know. <laughs> it's like. not really something to write home about, you know what I mean? We all tell each other, you're a great speaker, great speaker, but this is about as far as it goes, you know? Look on some sort of outside credibility, it ain't happening, you know? A mortgage application, I'm a great speaker, you know? I, uh, I mean, my wife, you know, I mean, just to stay on the point, I mean, I often tell this story in it. I'm sure there's some non-alcoholics here tonight. I mean, her, her and her mother, I'm fascinated. I am actually fascinated by non-alcoholics. You know, I was in the bar business for many years, and it just fascinates me. And I often tell this story because it's so indicative of the difference between an alcoholic and a non-alcoholic. I'm at this party one time with my wife, and uh, I got her a drink, and I got myself a soft drink. And a little time goes by, and I says, she comes over to me, and she goes, can you get me another drink? And I said, well, what happened to the drink I just got you? She says, well, I set it down, and I don't know where I set it. (laughs) And I'm trying to figure this out, and finally I said, you mean you lost it? (laughs) Nobody trying to tell me you lost your drink? Gee, as an alcoholic, I can't comprehend this. I'm thinking to myself, now I've lost my car, you know. That I understand. Is it over here? You know. I've lost a few days off the calendar, you know. I've lost a few jobs along the way. You mean I, I got to come in every Monday, you know, and uh, I'm saying to my wife, I've never, ever lost a drink. She goes, that's because in your case, you were holding on to like grim death, which if I remember wasn't too far away, you know, but... Um, uh, but Alcoholics Anonymous, right? I mean, it's incredible. The great miracle, not only the 20th century, but all 20 centuries. Because since man first crushed grapes, there's been people like us. Couldn't fit in, took drink, ran at life with drink, ran away from life without drink. We were society's first outcasts from the outside looking in. We were the people that... You know, we were the bewildered one, but we bewildered other ones. Why can you not stop for her? You think you had had enough. 
You think, I mean, even in my own case, people tell me for years, I used to drink every night at college, Paul, or I was in the army, but then I settled down. Why don't you? Yeah, why don't I? Because I didn't know when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous that I'm an alcoholic. I found out everything I need to know at Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Paul and I'm an alcoholic. And that tells me who I am, what I am, where I am, and what I need to be doing. And if I do that, I'm all right. And when I'm all right, everything around me is usually all right too, even if it's not. This great thing called Alcoholics Anonymous allowed me to come to terms with my past so I could live in the present for the future, which is the rest of today. I didn't realize as an alcoholic till I came here that one drink creates a thirst that I cannot quench. If Will Park had stopped drinking, I would have stopped drinking a long, long time ago. You need a lot of willpower to drink around the clock for days and days and days on end. You know, I didn't realize that came to Alcoholics Anonymous. As Bill Wilson says, the key to success is total surrender. I had to let go absolutely of all my old ideas. And one of my old ideas was somewhere, someday, perhaps I could have half a dozen drinks and get away with it. Because of Alcoholics Anonymous, because of May 12th, 1935, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, Bill W. and Dr. Bob meeting together. Because of those two people, people like me now have something between them and the first drink. Before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had never had anything between me and the first drink. I used to think about I go on these terrible drunks and I'd sit there after coming out of a hospital or out of a restraining sheet or been strapped to a bed and I'd sit there in the cold light of day and I'd say to myself, okay, Paul, wh- why am I doing this? Why am I dis- slow destroying my life? Why am I burning my life? Why am I blowing my life up? Why am I doing this? And this is the best I could come up with. Lack of willpower. If I had more willpower, I could drink like a gentleman. Lack of discipline. If I had more discipline. Lack of morals. I'm just a bad seed. And then my ace in the hole was punishment from God. If it wasn't for bad luck, I wouldn't have any. I got this mark of Cain. And I'm destined to walk the face of the earth with it. I got to Alcoholics Anonymous and I found out because of Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith that none of those things are true. I drink alcoholically because alcohol does something for me that nothing else does. Till I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and put those steps in my life. It changes me like that. Black and white to color, one drink. The closest thing to spiritual awakening in my life that actually wasn't one was drinking booze. It was this close. It looked like the real deal. It felt like the real deal. You thought it was the real deal, but it wasn't. It was bogus. It was counterfeit. It was phony. Because of Alcoholics Anonymous and those two men, I got that spiritual awakening in my life as a result of these steps, and I got something between me and the first drink today. It's not just me against a drink. Up until this moment in time, I have never beaten an obsession to drink. And I've gotten into the ring many times. My seven-year-old daughter could say, don't get in the ring. But don't get in the ring means don't take a drink. Until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I kept getting back in the ring. I tell myself, I'll bob, I'll weave, I'll stay off the ropes. But the result was always the same. I'm lying flat on my back, looking up at the light, saying, how did this happen again? The epitaph of the alcoholic, the next time will be different. And it's one more attempt at not drinking, followed by one more failure at drinking, followed by one more attempt at not drinking, as our book says, ad infinitum. Put a dot at the end of the page. Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith were sitting here tonight and because of those guys were miracles. Now I know we throw the word miracle around a lot in Alcoholics Anonymous. I had a bagel this morning. It was a miracle. (laughs) It had cream cheese on it. Another miracle. And it was toasted, you know. But what is a miracle? Let's face it. A miracle is a complete reversal or upheaval of the laws of nature. It's in my nature to be drunk right now, and I'm not. Now, how did that happen? didn't happen because of me. It happened because of these people. We do together what I can't do alone, and that's not drink one day at a time. As the guys told me in the old South Bronx group, it's a cinch by the inch, it's hard by the yard. Paul, we just do it one day at a time. On May 12th, 1935 at 5 o'clock, we can trace this moment in time back to that moment in time. 
right? Bill Wilson came in New- and, and Akron from New York. You all know the story. I'm going to hit the big time again. One more deal. That's it. I'm off to the races again. And then he had the thoughts of drinking again. And he didn't know much, but he'd been trying for six months in New York. And Dr. Silkworth encouraged him, one dog talking to the other alcoholics. And he had that divine inspiration, that divine thought, I wonder if I can stop drinking by trying to another, help another alcoholic. The turning points in all our lives, past and present. And those two men, and the third man, and the fourth man. It's funny, I was just talking to the guys there earlier on. I'm talking to a guy just in Man- was driving through Manhattan there this afternoon, and we're talking back and forth. And he says, guess where I'm driving right past now? I says, where? He says, I'm driving past 293 Central Park West, Towns Hospital. And his father had been in there twice in the early 60s. And that place, six months prior to Bill coming here, he lay in that hospital bed and he had that vision. He had that vision of a chain of drunks around the world, one drunk helping another. Not just around New York, a whole paradigm shift of one drunk helping another drunk. The turning point in all our lives. And that's what I often ask myself when I was coming here today, how strong is the link in my chain? It's as strong to the people coming behind me. And more important, it's strong to the people going ahead of me. If someone comes to me tonight and says, Paul, can I go to a place where I won't regret the past and I wish to shut the door on it? Can I comprehend the word serenity? Can I know peace? Absolutely. Walk this journey with us. Because in 1935, we've been walking this journey together, trudging the happy road of destiny, trudging, walking with purpose. There's a purpose to our lives. There's a meaning. There's a rhythm. I'm not sitting in some bar drunk today wondering, what's it all about? I know what it's about. Everything I need to know, I find out in Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Paul, and I'm an alcoholic. You know, and uh, I think about it like, when you think about Alcoholics Anonymous, what is AA? It's hope in human form. We'd rather see a miracle than hear one. We've been talked to, talked at, preached over, preached at. But when those guys came, those guys came to my house. The guy that 12-stepped me into Alcoholics Anonymous Knew Bill Wilson personally back in New York. Drank himself out in out of straight jackets in places like Bellevue Hospital. And he came to my house that day and he gave me something I hadn't had, had in a long, long time. He gave me hope. And he brought me to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm telling you, that's why I think it's so important and we're going to talk about the traditions this weekend to keep that door open for the still sick and suffering alcoholic whether it be inside or outside this room. I'd never been in Akron before in my life, but I guarantee you if I leave this podium right now, I wouldn't have to knock on too many doors and I'll find somebody drinking themselves to death right now. Totally oblivious to what's going on here in Alcoholics Anonymous. And what is our job here is to keep that door open for the still sick and suffering alcoholic, whether it be inside or outside this room. I don't want this to be like the old Don McLean song, American Pie, Oh, the music used to play, but it doesn't play anymore. You know, this is a, this is our watch. This is for us now to be custodians of this wonderful thing called Alcoholics Anonymous. I have had the blessing to travel to many places and go to many meetings and see this thing in its various forms. And it's unbelievable, the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. In my own life, I'll tell you a little bit of my story. As you probably realized, I'm not from the neighborhood originally. <laughs> it's about 25 years now since I left my native Cuba, and uh, <laughs> I grew up in a hard drinking neighborhood. I was one of these guys, oh, that's what alcohol does, believe me. I knew up close and personal. I grew up in a working class neighborhood on the outskirts of Belfast. It was a sort of a neighborhood, if you didn't drink, you moved. You know, everybody drank. I seen public drunkenness. I seen what alcohol could do to personal and a public level. And if you'd have told me where I was going to go when I took my first drink, I'd have said, you're out of your mind. You must be thinking of somebody else. But it's unbelievable. 
what alcohol did. I said that one drink from black and from 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 black and white to color like that. Now I don't know why, you know, looking back on it, I thought about it was that a symptom looking for a disease. I don't really know. But I had that stone in the shoe, that knot in the stomach. Booze will give you a lift, to give me a lift. But when it comes time to pay the freight, watch out. And the merchant of Venice, Shylock wanted just one pound of flesh, right? Not this disease. It'll take your job, your car, your wife, the shirt off your back. But what it really wants is me six feet under. I believe all terminal diseases, this is the most terminal. If I hadn't stopped drinking, drinking would have stopped me. And that's not some theory that I've come up with. I'm not running a lifetime. But I am around here long enough to know what happens if you take your eye off the ball. This disease will get you in the crosshairs and kill you stone dead with or without booze in your body. I don't need booze in my body to destroy my life. I almost destroyed my life in Alcoholics Anonymous because I wouldn't put the principles of AA into my life. I've tried not drinking. It's terrible. The minutes feel like hours. The hours feel like days. It's like, you know... Like sitting, I've been like the Count of Monte Cristo marking on the, on the wall. <laughs> Living sober with alcoholics and almas is a much better deal. This is the real freedom. I'm from Northern Ireland. I grew up during the, the war over there. We sang about freedom. We wrote books, read books about freedom. We talked about freedom. I wouldn't have known freedom if it had jumped up beside me. I was shackled to self by the very biochemistry of this illness. And the only thing that I knew to free me was putting a drink in me. But as I said there, it'll give you a lift when it comes time to pay the freight watch out. And I said there, I grew up in there, and my life's falling apart in short order. But I'm, a, I'm into the blame game. I'm a finger pointer. It's never my fault. It's you. It's them. They. They're out to get me. I could never really quantify who they were, but they're out there. Big working class Catholic from the wrong side of the tracks in, in Northern Ireland. Big chip on my shoulder. In fact, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, a guy says to me, you know something, Paul? You're a well-balanced guy. I thought to myself, finally somebody knows what's going on around here, you know? He says, yeah, you got a chip on both shoulders, you know? <laughs> I hated everything. I hated everybody. I was the guy that could always find the needle in the haystack and sit right on top of it, you know? I told you, you know, and uh, so I'm like blaming, you know, my life's unraveling around me in Northern Ireland, but I don't want to look at me. I'm just blaming conditions, outside conditions. And we get to Alcoholics and I'm AA 101. It starts with us. Happiness is an inside job. But I was always looking for that outside fix for the inside job. If I can just get things lined up out there, the right job and the right woman, the right this... It's no coincidence I'm standing in America when Irish Saxon was a runner, a long distance runner. This over the rainbow type philosophy somewhere, someday. All nonsense. And I came to my father and I said to my father, I said, listen. I said, I got some bad news for you. I said, I'm going to America and don't try and talk me out of it. He says, talk you out of it, I'll help you pack when you're leaving. <laughs> On you go, Columbus. Let me give you some fatherly advice. Turn left at Greenland, you know. (laughs) I hopped on the only airline to fly if you're an alcoholic. Aer Lingus, Ireland's national airline. I don't know if you've ever flown Aer Lingus. It's a a drunkard's dream. The the plane's going down the runway. The plane hasn't even taken off. And they're ready to get the drinks carts out, you know. The plane's at like a 45 degree angle. And the cabin staff are like Sherpas, you know, pushing the, pushing the drinks carts up to the front of the plane. And the whole plane's ringing their bell looking booze. You think you're in a pinball machine rather than an airplane. Bing, bing, bing. And like driftwood, I washed up in a place called Rockaway Beach, New York. Now, I, you talk to like the old timers in New York and what now, they go, oh, Rockaway Beach. It's a big Irish American neighborhood. They go, oh, Rockaway Beach. The Irish Riviera. <laughs> it should have been called Cirrhosis by the Sea. 
They had more alcoholics per square foot. You know what? It's amazing the alcoholic. We got this like built-in GPS system. You know, you could have blindfolded me and put me in a sack. I'm going to find a neighborhood that drinks as much, if not more, than the one I just left. And then to make matters worse, I, I, I got a job as a bartender. I'm using the word bar here in the loosest, <laughs> loosest. You know, we, say, we sort out sort of places, right? This was sort of a bar. It was sort of a bar you got thrown into rather than, out, <laughs> rather than out of, you know. This bar had it all. Alcoholics, drug addicts, degenerate gamblers. And that was just the staff. That wasn't even the customers, you know. <laughs> I'll just give you a mental picture and then I'll move on. If you want to see a full set of teeth in this bar, you need the 32 customers. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Male and female. Every now and again, like a glamour girl with like three teeth would stumble into the place, upset the whole ecosystem, you know? <laughs> hey, baby. But... Uh, I remember standing behind the bar one night in sobriety and I'm thinking to myself, this must be what like happy hour on the island of Dr. Moreau is like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, water finds its own level and still alcoholics and I fit it in there like a glove. I've experienced it before my drinking. I was a weekend drinker, a daily drinker, a morning drinker, a binge drinker. But I tell you, the drinking that done this alcoholic in, I became a periodic alcoholic. And you know the equation, the drunks get longer and the pay between them gets shorter. And now I'm hitting places I thought I'd never hit. I'm hitting hospitals. I'm having convulsions. I'm having seizures. The worst years of my drinking were after I made a firm commitment not to drink anymore. The worst years came after that. When I told myself, that's it. And I drank again, and I drank again, and I drank again. Because I hadn't got alcoholics and in my life, and without alcoholics and in my life, I have nothing between me and the first drink, and I will drink again or go off a bridge. And most alcoholics will drink first. And uh, I'm not going to go into the whole ins and outs of it, but I just paint a picture here. I... Uh, I was 30 years of age and it was just bottoms and more bottoms. And the terrible thing about this disease is you hear people saying, oh, if I go out there tomorrow, I'll be dead by the weekend if you're lucky. If you're lucky, you'll be dead by the weekend. It's usually death by a thousand cuts. And by the time you actually die from this disease, the time you actually graveyard dead, you've been physically You've been mentally and spiritually and emotionally dead for years. And everybody that mattered anything in your life, we should have died a long, long time ago. They asked Mother Teresa one time about, and she was working in New York, about, about the terrible poverty that she'd seen in, you know, in the subcontinent of India. She says, one, she says, no, one of the loneliest deaths of all must be the death of an alcoholic. Because they're devoid of any love of themselves or anything around them. It really is a terrible disease. Just killing you down from the inside out. Your actual soul, your actual spirit just atrophies before your very eyes. You know, and as Mother Teresa says, not that I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, that even God can't fill a cup that's already full. And I'm full, what am I full of? I'm full of hatred. I'm full of despise. The world, I'm a world hater. I'm a people hater. I'm a stop the world I want to get off. When's my ship going to come in? I can't catch a brick. What happened? How did I draw the short straw? And I drink on and drink on. But I'm here to tell you, I'm here as a recipient of a 12-step call in Alcoholics Anonymous. Just like Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob. And uh, the woman who's my wife today, I was in a bar. I'll just tell you one story towards the end. Just to sum up, I had never heard these three words together until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. Maybe some of you had never heard either. But when we hear them as a stanza, when I heard the words pitiful, incomprehensible, demoralization, I didn't have to ask for a translation 
Can I get a thesaurus, please? What does this actually mean? Every one of us knows what it means. Dying from the inside out of untreated alcoholism. And keep going back to the problem because we have no idea what the solution is. I'll just give you a quick vignette. I was in a bar. I used to have convulsions coming off drink. Now I'm having convulsions and seizures even when I'm drinking. I'm at the end of my rope. I'm in a bar. I must have run out of booze in the house. I'm in a bar and I collapse in the bar and go into a seizure. And they brought me to the local hospital where I'd been before and they filled me full of Librium or whatever to get me down off the ceiling. And I wake up. I'm in a restraining sheet handcuffed to a bed. And the woman who's my wife today is standing by the bedside. And eventually they take off whatever and I'm sitting there. I'm 30 years of age, and my life is just a complete disaster. Like Bill Wilson says, Bill Wilson sums up the end of an alcoholic's drinking better than any alcoholic I've ever heard. He says, quicksand stretched all around him. Boy, what a metaphor. No matter which way you turn, there's nowhere to go. And I took her hand, and I said to her, I said, Susan, I don't know why I can't drink, but it's obvious I can't drink. And I will never, ever drink again. Hand on heart. Solemn promise. Get a Bible. I'll even go there. But here's what happens to me. And I left that hospital. And if you told me I was going to drink again, I said, no way. That's it. I'm done. I don't know why I can't drink, but it's obvious. And that's it. I'm finished for good, for end. That's it. I'm done. But I didn't have Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't have 12 steps in my life. What do the 12 steps do? 12 steps bring me to a place of powerlessness, not to a place where I'm powerful, but to a place where I have access to power. People say about being an arm's length away from a drink. I suppose so. I'm going to tell you something. I'm 12 steps away from a drink. And that's a quantum leap from where I was when I first came in here. But before that, so I leave this hospital I don't have this. I don't have 12 steps. I don't have 12 traditions. I don't have access to power. It's just me against alcohol again. And even the most firmest resolve, when you go up to stepping stones, as many as have, and you see that big family Bible, where Bill used to write those promises in the Bible, I'm so sorry, and heartfelt notes after one more debacle. I'm sorry, Lois, it'll be different this time. It's going to be different. A fresh start, a new start. We've heard it all before. We know what that feels like, and we really mean it. That's the sad part. That's what puts people who are non-alcoholics into orbit. We really mean it. But because we have nothing, we have no access to power, it's just like paper in the wind. It just blows away. And I came out of that hospital, and here's what happens to me when I don't have 12 steps in my life, when I don't have access to power. Here's what happens to me when I go toe-to-toe with a disease called alcoholism. About a week goes by, and I get this stone in my shoe. I don't know where it comes from, but it's there all the time. About two weeks go by, I get a knot in my stomach. I don't know where it came from, but it's there all the time. About three weeks go by, the top button of my shirt feels tight all the time. About a month goes by, it feels like everybody's on my case, even if they're not. Put an X in the calendar. I'm drinking again. Now, is that a drinking problem? No. That's a living sober problem. Our book talks about it. Drinking problem. Even the hard drinker. Sufficient reason and they stop or moderate. Not us. What about the alcoholic? What about the real alcoholic? Us. Firm resolve. And I drink again. And I say, she said to me, what non-alcoholics say. I got to get away from you before I end up in asylum. And I said to her what alcoholics say. I don't need you. I don't need nobody. And I drank on after that. But I'm sitting in an apartment, and the guy who came to my door, and that's why I'm thankful for the non-alcoholic. I didn't make the phone call. I was totally out of my mind on drink. On oh, another no, bad drunk. And Susan, here's, here's, here's how God works in your life. I love when I hear people at the podium, and they go down, and then, and then there's that and then moment. And I sit up, because I know God's coming in the next sentence. I know I'm going to hear about a spiritual experience or awakening happening in the next sentence. The hand of God. 
And that's why it is this lack of spiritual growth that sometimes see the hand of God even in the thorns of our day. And you look at the history of Alcoholics Anonymous and Gail will talk about tomorrow and how God just, it's got to be providence. It's, it can't be nothing else. A left turn here, a right turn there would have been finished and the right people just come into our lives at the right time in the history of AA. Just when AA needed those people, they were there. And just in my life, that man Jerry came to my door. And I'm not saying like we're the chosen ones. I think God's, God's grace is like the rain. It falls on everybody. But I don't know. When that drop of rain fell on my face that August morning, I had that moan of clarity. I realized that I can't live like this anymore. And the guy down the street washed it off and drank himself to death. I don't know. But I know what I must do here. I must freely give what was freely given to me. Jerry had been an alcoholic since 1961. He wasn't off in some ivory tower reminiscing, hooray, it's not the way it should be or could be. He was still in the trenches helping another alcoholic. He was in the old South Bronx group. They had a mantra, we don't give up on anybody. And he came to my house and he shared experience, strength and hope. I thought I was the worst, I thought it was the worst drunk in town and he told me about hitting hospitals and straight jackets, and he says it can get worse. I was too sick to go then, but four days later, I went to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And walking in the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous is the greatest singular event in my life. Because unbeknownst to myself, I was moving from the problem to the solution. Now, before Jerry came to the house, he says to me, I said, I can't stop drinking, I can't stop drinking. And with typical alcoholic Homespun wisdom, he says, you can't stop drinking because you're an alcoholic. He says, don't worry, I'm coming over. He says, why don't you get down on your knees and say a prayer, I'm on my way. I thought to myself, man, what I call this guy for? I got some Billy Graham Bible thumper coming over to the house. I was going to ask him to stop and pick me up a quart, you know, but I said, I can't ask him now. I grew up in Northern Ireland. I grew up in the Troubles, where people literally shot each other outside the front door over religion. I remember when I was eight or nine, no, maybe six or seven, I heard this rat tat 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 open the door, and there was two guys laying dead in the doorstep. And I realized the war wasn't going on TV. It was actually going outside the door. God. I said, God. I'm going to be drinking. I thought it was real smug and bohemian. I said, God. <laughs> he never came down our street very often. But desperate times call for desperate measures. Quick sand stretched all around me. My back was against the wall. I was out of options. And you'd be surprised what you might do when you're faced with that pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization. And I did something that I hadn't done in many, many years. I got down on my knees and I said, if there's anything out there, please help me. And I felt like someone walked up behind me and took a great weight off my shoulders. A sense of peace came over me that I've never experienced before or since. And Jerry came to the door and I told him what I just told you. He says, Paul, you're the spiritual experience. It might get you sober, but it won't keep you sober. There's been people that have had those that have died drunk. Let's get you to Alcoholics Anonymous. And Jerry, I call him regular. Save my life. I go down to visit him in Florida regular. You want to see old timers in AA? Get down to Florida. He brought me to this meeting. He goes, I want you to meet the guys. The, aver the average age of the group was dead. <laughs> he says, it's a night meeting. It was four o'clock in the afternoon, you know. <laughs> and the group, they must have got, the meeting must have got like a group rate on, on cataract surgery. But, because the whole meeting was all wearing those big black <laughs> wrap-around sunglasses. <laughs> when I first walked in, I said, man, check this out. A virtual AA meeting. This is really... Man, these guys know how to do it down here, man. Really? <laughs> but... Uh, Jerry, I mean, a blessing in my life. As I said, there, 
I often say this from the podium. He came in alcoholics in 1961. In 1967, he was sitting in Bill Wilson's office. Six years off drink. But carrying something around. And you know how we let that one thing define us as a person. And we just can't let go. We just can't tell nobody. You know that feeling. And Bill talked, Bill knew, or Jerry knew Bill. And Bill did what apparently he did in those, 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 those times. He talked about the collective experience of Alcoholics Anonymous. He says, Jerry, it's been our experience that those people that try to carry the load alone pay a heavy price. And Jerry listened to him, talked to him one on one, and got up and left, and was drunk a few days later. He drank three more times, got sober again in 67, and has been sober since. And he talks about that one thing from the podium today. But he tells that story not to say, hey, I knew Bill Wilson. He tells that story to say that you can be sitting one-on-one with the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, sharing one-on-one. But if you're not willing to do what's required around here, you'll drink again or go for bridge. Even the co-founder cannot keep you sober if you're not willing to do what's required around here. We don't do this test because anybody that's new here tonight. We don't do this test because they're nice. We do them because they're necessary for recovery. If you want to get physically and mentally and spiritually and emotionally rehabilitated, please work this program. I know of no other way and I've tried every other way of trying to get sober and free without doing the steps. It was the last thing I tried and the first thing that ever worked. And if you're new here tonight, you're saying, oh, Paul, this all, you're all laughing. I don't, you don't see me laughing. I don't know if I'm ever going to laugh again. I backed myself into a corner. You don't know where I'm at. You don't know what I'm going through right now. And maybe that is true. Maybe that is true. But I'll tell you this. You hear that analogy. You go 10 miles into the forest. You got to go 10 miles out. I don't believe that in Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't care how deep and how dark and how painful that forest you're in right now is. As far as I'm concerned, the co-founders of Alcoholics Anonymous tell me you're just 12 steps away from a new life. That's all. Just 12 steps away from a brand new life. You hear people saying in AA, Oh, I came to AA and I got my life back. I don't want my life back. It sucked. (laughs) If you want it, go ahead. I had it for 30 years. You know, people have trouble with the third step. I I had no trouble with the third. God wants this? Here, (laughs) go right ahead. I did not balk at the third step, believe me. And if you're sitting out there and you're saying to yourself, oh, and I say this all from the podium, keep it simple, unity, service, and recovery. We have that symbol. And I believe you can do all three parts of the triangle from your very first meeting in AA. Unity. Just like Bill and Bob. We do, we do together what I can't do alone. Many meetings make it easy. Few make it, few make it hard. None make it impossible. Service. I got to give. And I got to give. I'm shackled to self. My holy trinity is me, me, me. My wife catches me all the time. In fact, even better, I'll tell you, one time my wife and I were having a, uh, let's just say, a heated discussion. And uh, my daughter was about four years of age. And we were talking back and forth. And my daughter was going like, no, like a tennis match. My daughter was going like this here. And then finally my daughter couldn't take it anymore. And she goes, what about me, me, me? And my wife goes, oh, not another one. (laughs) And it happens like that. In fact, my wife will be telling me some problem she's going through. And I'll glaze over. And she'll say, you're thinking hard. This is going to affect you, right? (laughs) And I'll go, no, I'm not. But I am. (laughs) And it happens like that. I remember I went to my sponsor one time. I go, you know, I think it's DNA. He goes, no, you would think it's DNA because it's so deeply rooted in you, but it's not. It's self-centeredness, as the book says, driven by a hundred forms of it. So that unity and that service and recovery. Maybe the steps do seem like a foreign concept. We have those slogans, live and let live, easy does it, one day at a time. 
And I believe, if you're new here tonight, it is not the grace of God. It's not the grace. I mean, if you don't believe anybody, God is not here. It's not the grace of God when you come in here on the worst night of your life, the one night that you need to drink the most, and you're given the grace not to drink for that one night. And you build upon that, and you build upon that. And that's why I love, I mean, I love working with newcomers. I love old timers, and I love newcomers. Middle management, you know, those guys in the middle. That's us. I'm in middle management. We know just enough to how to destroy this thing, you know. Those are the guys you got to watch out for. But Because sometimes we forget, we get caught up in the nuances of sobriety. And cut up in the gray areas and mix the big picture. I'm a hopeless alcoholic who by my own volition I'll be laying on the floor drunk. The great miracle in my life. I didn't drink today. You guys didn't drink today because of Alcoholics Anonymous. The longest I ever off drink by myself was six weeks. And it wasn't off drink. I was either thinking about a drink Drinking a drink or coming off a drunk, booze consume me 24-7. I'm as free today as I've been in any time in my life. I'm not saying my life's perfect. The same things that happen to people out there happen to people in here. I thought alcoholics and almost would give me the immunity from life. That's not true. It gave me the ability to do something I couldn't do before, and that's do life on life's terms. The good and sometimes they're not so good. I'm telling you, I mean, I'm not here to sell this thing. This thing sells itself. It's a program of attraction, not promotion. But I'll tell you my own personal life. You cannot get where I am today from where I came from without Alcoholics Anonymous. You just can't. It's an impossible journey. You just can't. And that's why I come here, and I keep coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. I know how the movie goes, but I wouldn't miss it for a moment. To see a guy coming in there and you see him a few months later putting his life back together again. That is a, that is as the book says, to watch a fellowship group around you is something you should not mix, should not miss. We have a front row seat for the very best that the human spirit has to offer. I could never get close to people. I mean, I, I, I was gregarious and outgoing, but I was a bit like the somebody Robert Moses, the, um, the urban planner from New York, the city, he loved humanity. He just didn't like people too much. <laughs> I loved humanity as a concept, but getting close to another person, alcoholics, and I, I put my arms around my sponsor, hug him tight. I mean, you know, the Irish, we don't do that very often, you know. I mean, that's a whole new learning experience in alcoholics and all. And I'm saying here, if you're new here, just this, this, this great thing, Called Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, talking about Jerry there. And he brought me to my first meetings in New York. I'll just tell you a little bit about New York sobriety. I was so blessed. The old South Bronx group that I talked about. And AA gives you hope in human form. One of the first guys I ever heard speaking was a guy called Gene McKay. He was like a legend in the South Bronx. Did 12 years unbroken stretch on the streets of Manhattan. 12 years, all seasons. He was 37 years sober when I first met him. And I heard him speak, and it gave me hope. Another woman, Gina H., seven trips to Rockland State Mental Hospital. He was sitting there sober. Then we used to go up to Jack B.'s old group, Sobriety Unlimited. They used to call it the Cops and Robbers group. Half the group was cops, and the other half was robbers. <laughs> I mean, really, you can't make this stuff up. And I'm sitting there, and it's like, early September and I look up and there's a Christmas tree with all the lights lit up I'm like what the what's going on here and this guy nudged me and goes every day is Christmas when you're not drinking kid and I says I get it I get it I know what's going on here Tanya man I know it's principles ahead of personalities but I've met some great personalities and alcoholics and almonds who put their hand out God works through people. People get people sober. And the conduit, conduit that he uses is the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the apparatus that he uses is a 12-step program. One alcoholic helping another. Just like Bill thought about when he had that vision in Towns Hospital, that chain link. One helping another. I thought my life was over when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. 
It was just beginning. Oh, there are people in my life when I was drinking. Absolutely, but things are different today. My world is built on concrete today. And just like that story that I used to read by a little girl at night, the world out there, which it will, will huff and it'll puff. But if I stay close to the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, my sober house won't blow down. That was not that case. Before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, where were we? We were lost. Where were we lost? On a sea of booze. And if there was any coordinates, it was pain and misery. And every now and again, wash up on dry land and try to build something. But everything was built on sand. And the first drink would always arrive again and we're washed out back to sea again. Because of Alcoholics Anonymous, we're solid here together. One alcoholic helping another. You know, and um, as I said, there are the great blessings of alcohol. In, in New York, there are, anytime I, sp- I sponsor anybody, I bring them down to Clinton Street, and I stand outside that house on 182 Clinton Street, and I look up there, and I think to myself, thank God for Bill, Bill W. Thank God for Dr. Bob. There's not a day goes by I don't say a prayer for those two men. Without them, I don't know where we'd be today. It's funny, a guy gave me something that I treasure. In fact, it was Jerry from Florida. He knew Bill pretty good. Bill gave him a, when the, when the, as Bill sees it came out, he gave him a written copy and signed it for him. And he also gave him a, a photograph of himself and Lois. And just best wishes, uh, Bill and Lois. And he gave me that photograph. And I keep it at the side of my bed. And it's funny, my little girl we would look at it and she goes, because we have, I have a lot of relatives and she has a lot of relatives in Ireland. And she goes, is that my grandmother and my grandfather? And I said, you know what? In a certain way they are. In a certain way they are. That is your grandmother and your grandfather. Because without those people, I don't know where I'd be today. You know, one day. As I said, they're talking about alcoholics and amas and they talk about, I mean, where are we? The book talks about it. We are survivors for the, from the sinking ship. We're brought here together. From the, from the captain's table to the steerage. You know, I've never been to this room before. A lot of people in this room I've never met before. But you tell me you're an alcoholic and I know enough. I know you've experienced terror, frustration, bewilderment and despair. I know you put a drink to your lips as the tears rolled down your face and you drank it anyway. I know that family and friends and loved ones stood there and pleaded with you not to drink and you drank. I know, like in my case, I sat there, talk about the damage in your human spirit, drinking against my own will, with the tears rolling down my face as I put the drink to my lips. You tell me, an alcoholic, I know enough. You know, and uh, we're here together, as I said, they're survivors from the sinking ship. And what do we do? Do we sail off into the sunset, patting ourselves in the back? No, we circle and go back looking for more survivors. And because of the 12 traditions in Alcoholics Anonymous, we're able to keep that boat st- steady, safe, secure. It's okay, as Emmett Fox said, having the captain on the bridge. But without those traditions, there'd be a mutiny below the decks, you know? You know, because I really believe that. And I think that's one of the great things that's often overlooked. But Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob, without those 12 traditions, I really believe that Alcoholics Anonymous would have completely collapsed under the weight of its own self-will. I talked to some of the old-timers there in New York, and even stuff you wouldn't think of is a guy I know, his name's Tom K. And he's the only guy that I know that was actually in AA when Dr. Bob was alive. He came in six months before Dr. Bob died, 1949. He had, and this guy Tom was one of the youngest guys in AA, he was 23, like the Wonder Boy. He put five years together and got drunk. He's got about 57, 58 years back. And he says, like, which we never think of, he said, when he came into Alcoholic Synonymous, he said, Bill Wilson had 14 years sobriety. He was the longest person sober in alcoholic with 14 years. He said, he went to the meeting, and they went to the diner after the meeting, and the guy nudged him and said, you see that guy over there? He's got five years. He's sober five years. Tom was like, what, five years? In those early days when AA hung by a thread. And he says, which I know we wouldn't think of it, but it would make sense. He says, when Dr. Bob died, a shockwave went through the fellowship. Is that it? What's going to happen now? 
One of the co-founders is dead. Can this thing go on? But because of the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, it's funny. And Bill knew that. The brilliance of those guys to get those traditions out there. The spiritual string that holds this package together. I know Bill tells a story that tells you sometimes when you go to the general service office, he was asked to speak at a meeting in New York. And everybody wants to hear you know, the white light experience at Towns Hospital. And they said, uh, there was a woman in the office and she goes to Bill and says, Bill, I have to go and speak at a meeting tonight. And it's on the traditions. Have you any advice for me? He says, good luck. <laughs> but they, pe- they persevered. And because of those guys and those traditions we have, that these doors are open for the still sick and suffering alcoholic where they've been inside or outside this room. I'll tell you a couple of stories about AA. I think it's the brilliance of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the very best, I said, that the human experience has to offer. And why? It doesn't matter who's sitting next to you in the lifeboat, but you better be willing to put your hand out and help them. I don't get to decide who sits in the, in the lifeboat, but I better be willing to help them. Because think about it, guys. Since 1935, on May 12th at 5 o'clock, from now on, when the families are sitting around, the non-alcoholics, and they don't know what to do, and they don't know what to, what's going on, and they don't know what to do with the alcoholic, my program tells me that I've asked, I better be willing to go. I mightn't be chosen, but I better be willing to go and help that man. It's not one of the most brilliant things in Alcoholics Anonymous. You look at that picture of the man on the bed. You think about the history of AA. It just encapsulates the whole magnificence of Alcoholics Anonymous. You have the gang. We've all been there, or woman, on the bed, drunk out, life falling apart, quicksand stretching all around, and the two guys sitting there, open, willing, hands out, with the book. And what's their spiritual calling card? They're saying, we are you and you are us, but we are not you today because of this. Walk this journey with us and you won't have to be where you are today. That one picture sums up the whole experience of Alcoholics Anonymous. And one alcoholic have another, regardless of gender or color or creed. We're alcoholics first and everything else second. And I see this very clearly and I often tell this and I'll tell it tonight. I go to meetings. I'm from outside of Belfast. My brother's sober in the fellowship over there. And I go back regular. And I go to meetings of, of Alcoholics Anonymous in Northern Ireland. I've been to meetings in Alcoholics Anonymous in Belfast in some of the darkest days of the Troubles. You talk about people who normally don't mix. I have people who never mix. But there's one place they mix. They mix in Alcoholics Anonymous. And everything else is left at the door. All the differences and whatnot. And they come in here. And they talk about their common problem and their common solution. And it's one alcoholic helping another. The very, I mean, you, as Dr. Bob said, you simmer this down. What is it? It's one alcoholic helping another love and service. I, um, I remember going to a meeting one time in Belfast. It's funny. We were in from West Belfast, which is the Catholic part of town. And we were going over to East Belfast, which is the Protestant part of town. And there was a bunch of Catholics in the car. And we drove across what's called the Peace Line. And this guy in the car says, Paul, you've been in America too long. Things are bad right now. We shouldn't really be in this part of town. But we're going on a speaking commitment. I love alcoholic humor. This guy says, you know, the last time a Catholic was in this part of Belfast after dark, he was in the trunk of the car, you know. And we go to the meeting, and the guys, we share, just like we do here, we share the experience, strength, and hope. It's one alcoholic helping another. I mean, I often tell about the brilliance of AA, the history of alcoholics and almost in Ireland. Ireland was the first country in Europe that AA went to, 1946. And if there was ever a country needed AA, believe me, it was Ireland. I know there's a few English people here. A I went to England in 1947. There's beat them by years. One of the few things that Ireland has beat England at, you know, but uh, that's not something to boast about. We got worse drunks than you that we needed A before you. <laughs> but it sums up what I was saying about one alcoholic having another. The guy was a guy by the name of Connor F. He was a retired policeman from Philadelphia. Now, he was born, there's a few people in Philadelphia here probably know this story. 
He was born in Ireland, but he worked his adult life in Philadelphia. He's home in Ireland on a retirement vacation, and he realizes there's no AA. And he writes a letter to General Service, and they had what's called a startup kit. And they said, well, why don't you start a meeting? And he was only sober a couple of years himself. And he did what Bill tried to do 10 or 11 years earlier in New York, running about hospitals, put a few ads in papers, was getting nowhere. And funny enough, just like in Bill and Bob with Henrietta, he bumped into a woman who was a non-alcoholic. Her name was Eva Jennings. And she told him about this hospital who had a doctor that worked with dr- drunks, or alcoholics. And he went to the hospital. And this doctor had been working with alcoholics. And he says, I had never even heard of Alcoholics Anonymous. He says, well, I'll tell you this. we got a guy down in one of the beds here. He's been detoxed 20, 30 times. There's times he's drunk on the way home from the hospital. If you make any impression on him, you'll have my full support. And Richard P., I'm sorry, Connor F. went down to the bed, and the guy in the bed, just the man in the bed, was Richard P. And this guy had been talked to, talked at, prayed at, prayed over. And he knew he was a dead man walking. And Connor F. did what I've tried to do tonight, shared experience, strength, and hope. Harry drank. Harry got sober. How the new person make it sober? And Richard P. knew, as we do, at that visceral level, that this was something different. Just like Bill and Bob. This was somebody talking my language. This is somebody that I can identify with. If we lose singleness of purpose, we're finished. I can identify, yes, yes, I did that. Yes, I did that. Yes, I did that. And Richard Percival, Richard P. got up out of his bed and those two men left that hospital and started the first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in Dublin. And Richard P. never took another drink of, to the day he died in 1973. That's the power of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the power of one alcoholic working with another. Just like Bill Wilson looking for Dr. Bob to keep him from drinking. You know, and I can't, we kind of miss that. And in my own life here, as I said, there, you kind of get where I am today from uh, where I came from without AA. I came in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was 30 years of age. I didn't even have a high school diploma. And all the shame and disgrace and self-loathing that goes with that. I'm in, working in this crazy bar. They cut me down to one night a week. And uh, I started getting sober, started going to meetings. And uh, a while goes by, and my, a guy says to me, my sponsor says, Paul, why don't you go back to school? I said, I can't go back to school. So what do you mean you can't go back to school? What do we say around here? Nothing beats a failure but a try. All we're asking you to do is try. Is it important how many times you fall down? Yes, but it's more important how many times you're willing to get back up again. You'll take a class. My thing. Well, what if I fail it? Well, then you'll take it again. Okay, I signed up. I took a class. I took another class. I enjoyed it because I was sober. Because I came out of the ether. I was enjoying it. Got a degree. Got a second degree. Got two graduate degrees. All because of Alcoholics Anonymous. The principles of Alcoholics Anonymous showing up one class, one day, one class, one day at a time. Got out of the bar business completely. And I, when I first I started, I became a teacher. And when I first started teaching, I wanted to teach the brightest of the bright, and that was all right for a while. And now I work in special education. And it's one of the great gifts of my life. Unfortunately, I visit children's ho- go to children's houses who can't get to school. And it keeps it green for me because it makes me realize that the problems I have today are luxury problems. As long as I keep firm with alcoholic snobs and keep my program in order. I go to kids' houses that are not going to get a high school diploma, but they want to learn. I love alcoholic snobs. I said they give me the ability to get back on life, to start to live the life that God always wanted me to live before booze took me down another road. And I came into AA, and I said there earlier on, I fought this program, Irish, Stoic, stuff, everything. I didn't want to open up the step, open up the steps. I was walking around Alcoholics Anonymous. I was full of resentment. I walked around here with two hefty bags full of garbage. 
stuff I was carrying stuff in the schoolyard and defending it and I'm justifying it and rationalizing it. I won't move through those steps and I'm carrying this stuff. And a guy saved my life and he says, Paul, you got to get free from the one guy you can never get free from, which is yourself. you got to live in the one place that you never live, which is today. And I was out of options again. I've been the jumping off place twice in my life. Once with drink, once without drink. Different type of pain, but pain nonetheless. And I backed myself into a corner in Alcoholics Anonymous. And the jumping off place again. And against my better judgment, which is most things, I started to put those steps into my life and finally get the freedom that they're talking about here. And I'll tell you, my life caught on fire. Just like with Bill and Bob, when I turned around and tried to help another alcoholic, that's when great events came to pass in my life. That's when my life took on new meaning. And things have happened in sobriety. As I say, the same things that happen to people out there happen to people in here. But something's different today. I've, I've accessed a power that I never had before. I'll just tell you a little story, then I'll wrap up because it tells me that this is a, it is one day at a time. It's a daily reprieve based upon my spiritual condition. I suffer, I'll be honest with you, I suffer from, from amnesia. I can forget like that what's going on in Alcoholics Anonymous so easily. Just, I mean, there's a couple of stories. I went one time with my wife. She worked in the travel business. And we went away to the South Pacific. And we're on the, we flew to Tahiti, took a boat to Maria. We're on this island. It's in the middle of nowhere, but there's no way in. And there's one problem that island, me, without a program. And there's one road around the island. And nobody's driving those little golf carts. I rented a car. And I'm cutting people off. You know, there's only like... One. I'm driving like a lunatic. I couldn't wait. I got back to Tahiti. I said, I got to get to a meeting. It was in French. I said, I don't care. And I went and the meeting was completely in French. Le douze top, the two of us. And I felt the warmth the minute I walked into the meeting. You know, it tells me that this is a daily reprieve based upon my spiritual condition. I'll just end on one story that reinforces that for me. I was about 12 years sober. And uh, we were moving into a new house. And we lived in an apartment. But my little daughter was getting older. And we're moving out of the house. There's nothing in the house. There's just a blow-up mattress. I'm there for the last night in the house. My wife's already gone with my daughter. I've just got to meet the guy, switch off the phone, hand over the keys. I'm laying this blow-up mattress, and I have a heart attack. It's like 3 o'clock in the morning, and I think I'm dying. And for some reason, I don't know why, typical alcoholic, I wanted to see what I looked like, you know, so I dragged... That's why they put mirrors in bars. There's a reason for that, you know. <laughs> and I finally, I left. Listen, let me tell you, if you're ever going to have a heart attack, don't have it in a blow-up mattress, you know. I mean, I'm like a boated fish, you know, rolling back and forth. I dry, look at myself. I'm completely yellow. My hands are shaking. The sweat's pouring off me. And my biggest fear is, I said, my wife's going to come here tomorrow with my daughter. Open the door and I'm going to land here dead. So I managed to get to the phone. I call her. Anyway, they get an ambulance, they bring me to the local hospital. No, bring them, they bring me to this heart hospital in Long Island called Long Island Jewish Hospital. They got a 24 hour team on standby. So the ambulance screeches up and there's all these people waiting there with clipboards and doctors and nurses and they're asking all these questions. They're asking them on a scale of one to ten, you know, and all this here and, and, uh, the lady's like, is this your wife? Yes, yes, that's my wife. And we see a cross around your neck. Are you a Catholic? I'm like, why is it better from Jewish, you know? <laughs> I'm typical alcoholic. Let me keep all my options open, you know? <laughs> the surgeon could then like, oi vey, can you believe this happened? <laughs> so I, they got me on the table. I flatlined on the table. Um, I'm dead for like three minutes. I have the whole after death experience. I'm like, I knew, I remember thinking to myself, like an alcoholic, I remember thinking to myself, I'm dead. I, I, you know, this is not good at all. You know, I, I, I'm like, and there's this voice was saying, I don't have this conversation, but keep walking. Everybody will understand. Everything will be all right. Keep walking. 
But I thought of my little daughter, my wife. I said, I, I remember pleading with this. I can't stay here. I can't stay here. I can't stay here. The next thing I'm floating, bang, I'm back in my body again. There's a team of people around. He's back online. The girl the nurse was holding me. You give us a scare there. They got me whatever, whatever. And figured out what the problem was. I had this problem from birth. Put some hardware in there. And the point of my story is this. They're friendly letting me leave from hospital. And I said to my wife, that's it. You're looking at the new me. With the program and this experience that I just had, I'm not going to get annoyed in traffic anymore. <laughs> I'm not going to get annoyed. Because every my wife goes, everywhere you go, you're next. You know, who's next? It's me. You know, you never... And sure enough, for about a week and a half, I was like the Dalai Lama of Long Island, you know? <laughs> Somebody had cut me off. I'd be like, peace be with you, my brother. Go right ahead. You must get to the toll booth. Go right ahead. I've been to the other side. This is not important. Really. Believe me. But I'm an alcoholic. I need a daily reprieve. I miss a few meetings. I'm not talking to my sponsor. And self returns like that. And that's why one alcoholic needs another. That's why Bill Wilson needed Dr. Bob and Bill D. And we're sitting here tonight with, an, uh, with hand and heart to our spiritual ancestors. We're recipients of what those guys did and opened those doors and kept them open. In the days when our futures hung by a thread. I'd be quite honest with you. I never took sobriety for granted. But I took AA for granted. Yeah, there's a meeting down there three nights a week. What's the big deal? They're lucky that I'm going. And you stay around here and you learn about the history. And you realize how precarious this thing is. And could still be today. If we don't watch ourselves, well. So I'll tell you, as Bill says, to, as Bob says to Bill getting this thing caught up with Freudian complexes that have no business here in AA. What are we at? It's one alcoholic having another alcoholic. I talked about it here tonight in my own life. I'm a just I'm not here at the customer service desk wanting to return this gift. It's the greatest thing, the greatest event in my life is coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. I haven't, if you're new here tonight, I haven't taken a drink. We haven't taken a drink since I walked in those doors over 19 years ago. Thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous. And thank Alcoholics Anonymous for God. And if you'll allow me for a few minutes, for a few seconds, I'd like to end. There's two things that are near and dear to my heart. One's called Ireland and one's called Alcoholics Anonymous. James Joyce said in one of his books, he was talking about Dublin, but it's so indicative of Alcoholics Anonymous. He says, here comes everybody. Look around, we're all here. And he said in one of his other books, which I disagree with, he says, Ireland sober is Ireland steel. That might be true, Mr. Joyce, before 1946. But now we have AA. So the two things that are near and dear to my heart is Alcoholics Anonymous in Ireland. And if you bear with me, I'd just like to leave you with a few words. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. It's a blessing. Thank you so much for inviting me here tonight. And thanks a lot. That's all I'll say. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.